just about the time I think I know everything about a particular subject uh, concerning the history of Port Huron, something comes along in my research to tell me that I don't know what I don't know. I'm uh, talking about the ferry system. I thought I knew all the ferries. There was a little gray stormer ferry, the Hiawatha, the James Beard, the Omar Conger, and of course later on there were the newer ferries which I call landing craft ferries. But there was also automobile ferries. And of course uh, I realized that uh, there was the city of Sarnia which uh, carried automobiles back and forth, the city of Port Huron, and the aerial ferry. And that's not even mentioning the very early ferries that we looked at uh, previously in, a, in other videos. But in addition to the city of Port Huron and the city of Sarnia and the aerial ferry, there was another auto ferry that went between Port Huron and Sarnia. And this ferry was owned by the Northern Navigation Company, which was in competition to the other ferries. I found this ad in the uh, Times Herald archives from 1922. And it says, do distant fields seem green? The big new ferry. Now, if you're French, you may pronounce this Louis Philippe. But since I'm English, I'm just gonna call it Louis Philip. So the big new steel ferry, Louis Philip, is the fulfillment of a long felt want. How many times have you looked across a river and sighed for new roads to drive on? The Lewis Phillip carried 35 automobiles and 500 passengers. And it tells you how you can get across uh, the things that you might need and also gives you the prices there. And something that the other ferries didn't have, at least not that I know of, it says music and dancing afternoon 3 to 5, evening 7.30 to 10.30. So that might be an added draw. This ad was from 1923. So the ferry had already been in service for the year of 1922 and now starting the 1923 season. And it says, at noon on Saturday, May 26, the big steel ferry opens her season. Everybody has been asking, when are we going to have the big steel ferry again? The Lewis Phillip, which last year gave Port Huron and Sarnia the finest ferry service on the border, will make her first trip from Port Huron at 12.15 noon on Saturday. And it goes on to give them some other details, but if you look at the bottom there, the dock, the foot of Grand River Avenue, it looks like it did share a dock space with the other ferries. We also have a photograph in the paper, not a real good one, but it gives you an idea of what it looks like, uh, so we we're glad to have that. But we're even more glad to have this photograph here that was shared uh, with us by Stan Schlater, or perhaps Slaughter. Anyway, Stan shared it and we we're glad to have it. This gives you a wonderful picture of the ferry, along with automobiles already on the ferry. And as we zoom in here, you can uh, see the nameplate there on the pilot house. If you're not familiar with the owner of this ferry, Northern Navigation, you can see in this postcard here uh, on the roof of the uh, building in the foreground, which was a uh, embarkment place for passengers when they went on the larger cruise ships. But uh, I imagine the ferry ran out of there as well. But you can see that it was uh, south of the other ferry dock. You can, and you can see one of the ferries pulling away from that dock. On a side note, uh, much earlier in about 1918, this would have been before the Lewis Phillip Ferry. They, uh, they had ferries that went across the Sarnia, like they normally do, but they would go to the Northern Navigational Pavilion, which is what we looked at. They had the signage on the roof. And from there, they would board a, a passenger ship. Uh, in this particular case, I think it was the uh, Harmonic. They would go for a cruise for about three hours and there was dancing available for uh, five cents extra. You could take the cruise for 50 cents, 55 cents if you wanted to dance. Doesn't seem like much, but it was 10 times what the ferry cost because the ferry cost a nickel. The dancing was actually started on the pavilion and then later would be moved to the cruise for those that took the cruise. I would imagine you could have just danced on the pavilion for five cents. 
This shows under the roof uh, where the dancing would uh, take place of the Northern Papillion. So, how long did these dances uh, last? Well, not very long. According to the Sarnia Journal, it says, Rowdies put end to dances on romantic rooftop pavilion. With soft breezes wafting off the St. Clair River and the popular mechanless orchestra setting the mood, the rooftop garden pavilion was an ideal venue for a night of romantic dancing under the stars. That night, a large crowd from Sarnia and Port Huron was expected for the first of the informal dances. The pavilion floor was declared in excellent condition and the refreshments prepared. Sadly, the enthusiasm did not last. The evening's agenda was printed in the previous night's newspaper and Sarnia's federal member of parliament, F.F. Pardee, was there to officially open the proceedings. On August 26, less than seven weeks after they began, Pardee declared the rooftop dances over and done. Rowdyism and filth were cited as the reasons. It seems dances had attracted some of the seedier elements of society. Property was damaged. Cigarette butts carelessly discarded. Fights had broken out. The young ladies who worked so hard to make them a success were aghast. There had been no sign of an apparently overworked and undermanned police department. The newspaper railed against the outrageous conduct. For the young women of the city and for a public in need of diversion after four years of war, it was a sad day indeed. I've often thought to myself that if I had a time machine and could go back in time for a few hours at one particular place, then where would that place be? And I decided it would be at the foot of Grand River because that's where the White Star Dock was and that's where the, the ferry docks were. I think I would like to join these ladies sitting out there on the balcony uh, looking at the different excursion liners that came in. So much was happening, so many people to see. I like the people watch. I like this photograph too because it gives a, a different perspective. Usually you see the white star dock looking toward the water. But in this uh, photograph you can actually look up uh, Grand River going east and uh, see what it looked like back then. In the distance, that steeple is First Baptist Church. In a large building on the right, the dark building, that's the messenger uh, house or hotel. And the street that's going between the messenger hotel and the White Star Dock is Commercial Street, which is no longer there. But this uh, Grand River uh, uh, Street is uh, interesting because if you look here, you can see it looks like it was paved for the main part of uh, the uh, business section. And then when you got to Commercial Street, you can see a curb here where it drops off. Then it looks like it's dirt from there to the dock. And then you can see where the boards start uh, for the dock. So I thought that was kind of interesting. The White Star Dock would have been to the north of Grand River Avenue, and the uh, ferry docks would have been uh, to the south of Grand River Avenue. Of course, Grand River didn't go all the way to the water, as you could see uh, in the last photo. But if it did, that's where it would be. I think to be one of the most exciting places to be if you could go back in time and sit there and watch all the people going and, and coming. And it seems like there's always something going on to look at. Here's something exciting that happened back in 1922 I found in a newspaper. Considerable excitement was caused at the foot of Grand River Avenue Sunday when an automobile driven off the ferry, Lewis Phillip, by an unidentified woman, ran amok and crashed into a sidewalk soft drink counter against the wall of the White Star Line dock building. The crowd from the Tashmoo had left and there were few persons about, or death or injury would have been caused by the accident. I wouldn't have wanted to miss that. By the way, this was the captain of the uh, Lewis Philip uh, Ferry, a uh, fellow by the name of Captain John Duby. Here's a wonderful piece of history from that era, a little memorabilia that you could uh, look at. 
This is a boarding pass uh, for the Port Yarn Sarnia Ferry Line. It looked like this fella didn't use up his complete pass. I see uh, four holes, but he got eight slots, so I think he had some more to go. Maybe he lost it, or maybe the bridge got built and he didn't want to take the ferry anymore. Who knows? Because it seems like every postcard we see at the White Star Dock, it seems like the Taj Mu is docked there. But uh, I think we misunderstand if we think that was the only ship that came there. There were many excursion ships that docked here. The Taj Mu would only dock maybe once a day, twice at the most. But in between, there were a lot of other ships that stopped here as well. One of those ships was the city of Alpina. And as we zoom in here, you can see where the side paddle wheels are. You can see the name of the ship uh, on the outside of the paddle wheel, city of Alpina. Here's a postcard with a little different view uh, of the White Star Dock and of the Alpina as well. The city of Alpina wasn't owned by the White Star Line. It was owned by the DNC Line, uh, Detroit, Cleveland, and uh, ran from Detroit uh, to Port Huron and, and further north. Here's another uh, postcard that shows the city of Alpina. But I think this one is probably the best photograph of the Alpina. It shows a lot of detail. And you can see the DNC logo uh, prominently displayed on the bow. But let's look at some of the other ships in the White Star Fleet that don't get as much attention as the Taj Mu did. And this advertisement by the White Star Line, you can see uh, in about the middle of it, it says passengers taking Taj Mu can go as far as Algonac and return on Awana or the Wakita arriving back in Port Huron at 8.15 p.m. So folks that wanted to leave Port Huron and go to St. Clair or Algonac, uh, but not all the way to Detroit, could go as far as Algonac and come back on one of the other uh, of the White Star fleet. And uh, the first one we want to look at is the one mentioned here, the Awana. None of the other ships in the White Star Line were as large as the Tajmu, but they were still pretty big ships. They could hold a lot of people. And here you see a great photograph of the Awana. Of course, the Awana was berthed in Detroit, and you can see it here in the middle between the Tajmu and one of the DC ships. And I actually found a postcard uh, showing it docked at the White Star Dock in Port Huron. When the White Star Line uh, moved the Awana to a different route, the Wakita took its place. It made its debut in Port Huron on May 8, 1909. The newspaper said this, The Wakita arrives in Port Huron on first trip. Handsome new boat, especially designed for work. The new White Star passenger steamer Wakita arrived in Port Huron from Detroit last evening at about 9 o'clock landing at the company dock at the foot of Butler Street, it being her first trip to this port. A large number of people boarded the steamer and inspected her. The Wakita is a trim vessel capable of accommodating 1,500 passengers. She is finally finished and presents a luxurious appearance to the visitor. At the head of the main stairway to the cabin, stood a large floral horseshoe bearing the name Wakita in purple across the top and a card bearing the inscription, Good Luck Wakita. Besides stateroom privileges and all the conveniences of lake steamers, the Wakita has a fine cafe where everything is served equal to that usually obtained in the better class of hotels. The Wakita takes the place of the Awana between Detroit and Port Huron. And in this photo here, you can see it coming up through the St. Clair Flats. There was somewhat of a scandal that involved the Wakita, or at least a scandal in many mothers' and fathers' minds, because their daughters, who were accompanied by young men as chaperones, stayed out all night and never got home until about 7 o'clock the next morning, when they were supposed to be home probably about 11 o'clock. What had happened, I'd be known to the parents, is that uh, the Wakita got surrounded by fog, and the captain was afraid to move the ship for fear it might be in a collision with another. And so they dropped anchor, and they waited out the night. 
On the front page of the paper, it says this, Marooned all night, exchangeites and women guests fogbound aboard the Wakita off Ricard's Point. The exchangeites were a social group. And it goes on to say, Wonder what the neighbors will say. Dance and song weary, yet with infectious laughter, still wrinkling, drooping eyes, 150 young men and women, exchangeites, and their guests stepped down the gangplank of the steamer Wakita at 7 a.m. today to face anxious queries of neighbors, mothers, and little ones. Wonder what the neighbors will say. Mother will be worried. Dad so angry. And oh, what did little Suzanne do without her mother? Why, well, I looked that up as an old-fashioned word for mother. The young people had a grand time dancing the night away in the grand ballroom of the Wakita. The parents, not so much. All right, the next steamer we want to look at in the White Star Line is the city of Toledo. Here we see uh, it at the White Star Dock. Uh, it's the one that's farthest away in front of the Alpina. But in this photograph here, we have one by itself. And the postcard says, Steamer, City of Toledo, Port Huron, Michigan. I like this photo here that shows the rear of the ship, uh, but that's not why I like the photo. I like the photo because of that lady uh, sitting on one of the dock pilings, and she's sitting up there like a little bird, feet nowhere near the ground. It makes you wonder how she got up there. Here's a very nice picture of the city of Toledo. As we zoom in here, you can see all the people on board, someone on every deck. And you can see what it looks like in color on this postcard, at least the artist's version of it. One of the things that have been common in every photograph I've showed you of the city of Toledo is that it had one smokestack. But in 1917, the ship was lengthened another 40 feet to 252 feet, making it one of the larger uh, ships in the White uh, Star Line. And then also a second uh, smokestack was added. And you can see in this photograph that the ship is much larger. On a side note, uh, I know most of you realize the White Star Dock at the end of Grand River, but there was also a White Star Dock in South Park. I, I uh, touched on this in an earlier video, although I certainly didn't have much information and nothing that I ever saw in print about it. But since that time, I have seen something, including this article here. Like most of the excursion ships, they did special excursion. It says here, to hold moonlight River outing will be held tonight on Steamer City of Toledo. But the part I want you to look at is this. The Steamer City of Toledo will leave Sarnia at 8 o'clock Sarnia time and the White Star Line dock at the foot of Grand River Avenue at 8 o'clock Central time and the South Park at 8.15 this evening. So definitely there was a White Star dock at South Park. And then I found this article here Wakita will not land freight at South Park Dock, owing to the show which has been built up near the South Park Dock of the White Star Line. No freight can be handled into that port by the steamer Wakita. So another documentation that there was a White Star Dock there. The thing that confused me, I never saw it on the stops of any of the schedules, but we know they stopped there, unless they consider Port Huron as two different stops. In this photo taken at South Park, you can see the Tajmu there and you can see the dock. And I believe that is the White Star Dock. But I never knew exactly where it was. But I think I got a pretty good handle on it now. I found this article in the paper from 1907. Starline Dock. A petition asking the White Star Line to locate a dock at the foot of Connor Street has been largely signed by the merchants in South Park. If the dock is secured, it will be a great help to those who have freight to ship. So that's the first clue. Uh, it would be at the foot of Connor Street. The other clue was that I found an article about uh, the United Fence Company, which was also at the foot of uh, Connor Street. And it was said it was built right next to the White Star Dock. So we have a pretty good idea where it's at. I know most of you don't care where it was at, but that's just a historian in me. I just got to find things out. The last of the White Star steamers that we want to look at today is the Greyhound. 
Like most of the White Star steamers, uh, it was propelled by the paddles on the side of the ship. And you can see them quite clearly in the uh, early models, uh, but several models, several ships, I should say, try to make their ships look more sleek looking. And this was one of them. And in this photo here, taken as it was going by Taj Mill Park, you can see the paddles quite clearly. There's no attempt to hide them there. But in this photo, it's completely different. It's much more sleek looking here. And you can't really see where the paddles are, but if you look down below the word Greyhound, you can see where the paddle is because the water is turning there. And that's where the paddle is hitting the water. As we work our way back up to the bow, you'll see a picture of the Greyhound, the dog, the Greyhound, uh, right above the lettering Greyhound. And this wasn't painted on the ship. These were actually uh, Greyhounds that were carved out of wood and put on the bow of the ship. And I understand the wooden carved Greyhounds still survive at the Great Lakes Historical Society in Ohio. Ohio, because that's where the ship was birthed. It traveled from Toledo, Ohio to Port Huron, Michigan, first stop being Detroit. Here you see the Greyhound berth in Detroit up to the dock, and uh, it's the ship on the left, and you can see how much bigger it is than the other ships. After World War I, there was another class of ships that sailed the lakes. These were the big steel hulled ships of the DNC line that were bigger, and they were faster and more luxurious. As World War I drew to a close, DNC already had four successful vessels. There was the Eastern States, which you see here, the Western States, and then there were also two other ships. The city of Cleveland Three, as you see in this photograph, and also in this postcard docked at the White Star Dock. Notice in this postcard the ship is facing south. And all the other postcards that you've seen of the White Star Dock, the ships were facing north. That's because they were coming from Detroit. This ship was coming off the lake, probably from Mackinac Island. Port Huron was never considered a destination stop. It was more like a pit stop. As you can see here uh, on the DNC schedule, you've got Mackinac Island, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo, Niagara Falls, and Wayports. I think we'd be considered a wayport, perhaps stop for a few or supplies, whatever, perhaps a couple hours to look around town. But uh, I really don't know how long they stopped here. But we know they did because we have a postcard that shows it. The fourth and last ship we want to look at uh, in the DC line at that time is the city of Detroit 3. Now you folks that follow my videos know that I love the Taj Mahal. I think it was the finest ship of that era. But this was a different era. In this ship, the city of Detroit 3, made the Taj Mahal look like a poor cousin. It was very luxurious. Fortunately, we have some historical photographs of the inside of the ship that I think will amaze you. This was the Grand Salon. This was the showroom of the ship. And this was looking toward the front of the ship. And this is a postcard showing it in color. Here's a black and white that gives you a little bit more detail of the ceiling. Here's the same salon looking uh, toward the rear of the ship. And you can see uh, the staircase is going up to the next level and also down to the next level. Here we see the top of the staircase with a rather large murrow uh, at the top of it. And in this one here, we can see the color version. And here's a little closer look at it. This is a photo of the forward gallery. This part of the ship was known as the Palm Court. I don't know why it was called Palm. It don't look like palm leaves, but it does look like ivy, at least green, as we can tell from this color version here. These next three photographs are taken from the Gothic room. It almost uh, appears to be like a cathedral. You can see there's decorated glass on the left. And in this photo, you can see what that glass is. It's a picture of the French explorer, La Salle. And here's the other side of the Gothic room. 
The DNC line would go on to build two even larger ships in the greater uh, Buffalo and the greater Detroit. And in this ad, they compared them to some of the tall buildings in Detroit, and you can see how much longer they are compared to these buildings. The DNC line operated from 1868 to 1951, and is often referred to as the owner of many of the Great Lakes' best floating palaces. Well, this ran much longer than I anticipated, but I'm sure if you weren't interested in history, you would have already shut it off by now. <laughs>